oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, today we learned that 149 Liberal MPs have been using taxpayers' dollars to pay the Prime Minister's good buddy, Tom Pitfield, to help Liberals get elected. Mr. Pitfield isn't just the Prime Minister's friend, but his wife was the President of the Liberal Party, and they both were with the Prime Minister on that infamous billionaire island trip. Just a typical day in the life of these corrupt Liberals. But Mr. Speaker, who instructed these Liberal MPs to use their taxpayer-funded budgets to pay the Prime Minister's friend to do political campaign work? Okay. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government believes strongly in the work that all members do for their constituents. It's very, very important work, and Canadians need to know their MPs are advocating for them. They also need to know MPs have the ability to keep up with all the files of the people they represent, and the technology that has been raised here today is used by our MPs to help manage their constituency casework. So Canadians are being served well by the MPs through the system. Well, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Well, liberal, liberal friends are certainly being served well. 200000 for Katie Telford and Gerald Butt's moving expenses. Half a billion for the Prime Minister's friends at We Charity, and now tens of thousands of taxpayers' dollars for another one of the Prime Minister's buddies. Mr. Speaker, it pays very well to be a friend of this corrupt Prime Minister. But Canadians cannot afford more of this unethical behaviour. So again, who in the government told 149 Liberal MPs to give taxpayers' money to Tom Pit Pitfield, the Prime Minister's friend and colleague? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, what Keynes can afford anymore is this blockage from the, from the Conservatives. We have very important bills ahead of us in the Parliament that he, it needs to be voted on, and the, the Conservatives try to shut down Parliament. They've been filibustering. They didn't want uh, they didn't want to add additional hours so we can work, and we're ready, here ready to work for all Keynes, Mr. Speaker, and the Conservatives should stop playing their games and support us, support Canadians. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Well, let's talk about the important work of Parliament. Today, oh, wrong one, Mr. Speaker. In less than an hour, the President of the Public Health Agency of Canada will appear before the bar of this House of Commons. This Parliament, this one, Mr. Speaker, has asked four times to see the documents relating to the firing of two scientists from the National Microbiology Lab. Now the agency has been found in contempt of Parliament for failing to hand the documents over. Will the government confirm that they will stop the cover-up today and allow the president of PHAC to table the unredacted documents to this, the People's House? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know, it's disappointing to see the opposition play games with Canadians' national security. That member knows full well that unredacted documents were provided to the appropriate committee of parliamentarians who have the expertise and clearance to review documents that are sensitive in this nature. We'll never put Canadians' national security at risk, Mr. Speaker. And I would really hope the member opposite understands why that's important. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What's really important, Mr. Speaker, is that we respect our institutions. In less than an hour, the President of the Public Health Agency should be here in this House to hand over documents regarding the events at the laboratory in Winnipeg. That's an order of this House. An order, not simply a whim. In an hour, we will know whether the Government of Canada respects institutions whether it respects the will of the House of Commons. Will this government allow the Public Health Agency to table the documents that Canadians want to see to understand what happened in Winnipeg? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the member opposite does not respect institutions, nor does the member opposite respect national security. And don't take it from me, take it from Thomas, Thomas, Thomas Junot, the associate professor at University of Ottawa, who said this is a big setback for the parliamentary oversight of intelligence in Canada, and more broadly for efforts to improve transparency and accountability. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives are playing a dangerous game, and they know that. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. What is actually dangerous, Mr. Speaker, is to violate the orders of this House. Perhaps the expert doesn't know that, but the Minister should know. The documents requested will be tabled here at the clerk's table, and the clerk will do his duty 
He's going to look at the documents. He's going to redact the parts that could be compromising, and he will present the results to the members. That is our work as serious elected officials. Why is this government playing the petty politics with national security by violating the will of the House? The Honourable Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, that member opposite knows those unredacted documents have been provided to a committee of parliamentarians that has the appropriate oversight to be able to look at them in a safe way that protects Canadians' national security. But why take it for me? Let's listen to Stephanie Carvin, also a professor at Carleton University. And she said, this bulldozer approach to national security is misguided, dangerous, there's that word again, and will result in a less transparent system overall. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, the EI system is one of the great failures of the pandemic. The program is so ineffective that the federal government had to invent the CERB. If not, millions of families might have ended up in the street. And we see that with uh, workers in the culture sector who are often freelancers. Last week, the government of Quebec wrote to ask that the EI system reform consider the unique status of artists and cultural workers. Will the government collaborate with Quebec to reform EI so that it properly covers people working in the culture sector and freelancers? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the answer is yes. We will keep our promise to modernize the EI system thanks to a historic investment in, co in cooperation with Canadians, employers, and all stakeholders. We will implement what is in the letter from Quebec. We will continue to work with stakeholders and the provinces as well as experts. We will continue to modernize the system in order to ensure that all employees are able to access the program. The Honourable Member for La Prairie Mr. Speaker, we shouldn't forget that the economic recovery will not help cultural workers this summer because they won't be able to tour or play to full houses this summer. They were some of the first to be laid off and they will be some of the last to get back to normal after the pandemic. They are falling through the cracks. This is urgent. EI was never there for them. And today, despite the emergency measures, they may suffer due to the, to the decrease in the CRB. This is urgent. What will the government do to help businesses in the cultural sector as well as workers? The Honourable Minister. It's the beginning of this pandemic. That's exactly the kind of worker we've been trying to help, whether it be through the CERB or through the CRB. Mr. Speaker, Bill C-30 has measures in it that will extend the CRB, that will help out businesses, that will help out um, employers who want to retain their employees. What we can do as a parliament for this country, Mr. Speaker, is support Bill C-30, get money to workers, get money to businesses, so we can all get through this pandemic. Thank you. The Honourable Member for North Island Powell River. Mr. Speaker, as the number rises of Indigenous children found in unmarked graves in Canada, this government is continuing to re-traumatize Indigenous families. A human rights tribunal found that the government discriminated against First Nations kids, and instead of making it right, the government keeps fighting these kids in court. This isn't a collaborative process, Mr. Speaker. The government is taking Indigenous kids to court. Since the last time I asked the minister, the government has been in court for another week. So I'll ask again, when will the government stop fighting First Nations kids in court? Honourable Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think it's important to be clear to all Canadians and Parliament that as part of this process, uh, not a single child has had to testify. Uh, there are competing class actions that um, require us to look at this process as a whole. We are currently in confidential discussions with parties, uh, and those will remain confidential. But let me be clear once again, every single First Nations child that has been discriminated by the broken child welfare system will be fairly, justly, and equitably compensated. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, this weekend, Black Lives Matter Toronto organized the first national gathering of Black and Indigenous families affected by police violence. Families stood outside the Prime Minister's office demanding action. Anthony Oss, Jamil Francic, Regis Kronilski Paquet, Rodney Levi, Abdi Rahman, Abdi Aisha Hudson, Andrew Luku, Jermaine Carby, Chantel Krupta, Chantel Moore. Mr. Speaker, when will the Prime Minister heed the calls from these families and end police state violence against? against the bodies of black, indigenous, and people of color. The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, we take these calls to action very seriously. We know that the pandemic has impacted all Canadians and disproportionately certain segments. We know that racism, systemic racism exists within our institutions. And that's why in budget 2021, we see numerous measures to actually address a lot of this important work. It's important that we pass this legislation and really unfortunate that there are political games being played. We recognize that every department and agency, every minister has a role to play. We take this work seriously. And that's why we're working closely with the anti-racism secretariat. I look forward to working with the member. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. When asked why 97% of Liberal MPs offices were uh, paying Tom Pitfield, the childhood friend of the Prime Minister, his uh, fellow vacationer to Billionaire Island, the uh, Liberal Member for Scarborough Guildwood said, I haven't got a clue. I can't explain it. I vaguely recall once a year we write a check and it's always been explained that it's within ethical guidelines. So we all kind of sign up for it and it goes into some oblivion. Yikes. Who in this government told these Liberal MPs to sign taxpayer dollars into oblivion? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I explained earlier, our government believes strongly in the work that all members do for their constituents. It's extremely important work, Mr. Speaker, and Canadians need to know their MPs are advocating for them. They, they also need to know that uh, the MPs have the ability to keep up with all the files of, of the people they represent and the technology that we're discussing here is used by our MPs to help manage their constitution casework, Mr. Speaker, and Canadians are being served well by the MPs through this system. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, the government House Leader says it's no big deal, so I guess we better take his word for it. Like those Liberal MPs should take the word from this Prime Minister and this Cabinet who've been found guilty of multiple ethical law breaches that there's no ethical mis misdeeds happening here. Speaker, Tom Pitfield is a close friend of the Prime Minister. These are more Liberal insiders getting ahead on the backs of hard-working Canadians. So, who in the government told these Liberal MPs to cut a check to the Prime Minister's friend, Tom Pitfield? The Honourable Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's, that's a bit rich coming from that member who tried to shut down Parliament not too long ago. The Conservatives are trying to change channels here, but the thing what's happening at this moment is we're trying to work for Keynes. We're trying to, to adopt bills that are extremely important, including the budget, Mr. Speaker, with elements that are extremely important for Keynes. And what do the Conservatives do? They block, they filibuster, the way it's time of the House, and Mr. Speaker, now it's time for them to stop their games and support our work for all Canadians. Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. What's rich, Mr. Speaker, is hearing the government House Leader, who sat on the side of the most corrupt government in this country's history, talk about shutdowns. They prorogued this House during a pandemic, yeah, yeah. filibustered dozens of hours across multiple committees, mismanaged the House's agenda so badly that they find themselves unable to get what they deem key legislation passed at the end of the parliamentary session. He should be ashamed, just like he should be ashamed of how they're misappropriating taxpayer dollars to subsidize Liberal political options operations. So this Liberal Minister needs to tell us, through you, Speaker, is he complicit? Was he the one that gave the order for 97% of the Liberal caucus to misappropriate tax paper, taxpayer dollars? The Honourable Minister. Well, I think, Mr. Speaker, that that member should be ashamed. He, he got up a couple of weeks ago on a Thursday morning, but around 10 a.m. when people go to work and said, well, you know what, we've worked enough, we're going to stop and go back home, home. No way, Mr. Speaker, we're there to work for Kenyans, Mr. Speaker. They want to talk about proroguing. They're the champions, international champions of proroguing, Mr. Speaker, with no reason in their case, Mr. Speaker. So they should stop blocking and they should work with us for the benefit of all Kenyans. Honorable député de Mégantic. The Honorable Member for Mégantic l'Érable. Mr. Speaker, it's pretty clear that it's great to be a member of the inner circle of this Liberal Prime Minister. Do you know the name of Tom Pitfield, a long-term friend of the Prime Minister? Well, he's also the owner of a business called Data Science, a business which does uh, IT support for liberalists, that partisan liberal tool. And today we learned that 97% of Liberal members, 149 MPs, use their writing, as their writing budget to pay for data sciences services. Who asked Liberal MPs to pay for the services of the friend of the Prime Minister, the Honourable Minister? Mr. Speaker, I already explained that the technology that is being mentioned here was used by members to manage the writing association tech. That's it, Mr. Speaker. 
And I find it upsetting that the conservatives are trying to change the channel because there's something very shameful going on. They are blocking bills that are essential. Many programs' benefits will be ending in nine days, Mr. Speaker. And if this budget is not adopted, that's what will happen. And these conservatives are just blocking and blocking. They need to stop doing that and start working with us for the benefit of all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Mécantique l'érable. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to explain to the government house leader that this issue is so sensitive that two Liberal members said they didn't even know why they were paying data science with parliamentary resources. They said that instead of telling the truth, Mr. Speaker. The Liberals are writing checks to a friend of the PM without even knowing why. Is that really what Liberals are saying? We only learned about these partisan payments to data science recently. Mr. Pitfield, however, has been responsible for the Liberals' digital services since 2015, and he probably will be after the next election. Will the Prime Minister tell us how much money his good friend received from members' offices since 2015? The Honourable Minister. Can my colleague tell me when Conservatives will stop blocking the budget, when they will stop blocking C-10? when Conservatives will stop blocking C-12 so we can work for the future of our children and our grandchildren, when Conservatives will stop blocking C-6, which is about a, 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 a process that hurts our LGBTQ youth. Will he tell us when the Conservatives stop blocking these progressive bills? When will they stop start helping us to help all Canadians? The Honourable Member for Mécantique l'érable. There were 183 hours of filibustering on C6 at committee, Mr. Speaker. It's the Liberal government that is unable to handle the agenda of the House. And the member for Malpec confirmed to the Globe and Mail that the Liberal Party has been gathering partisan information from writing associations. He said that members need to be cautious when they use the system to avoid using the information for partisan reasons. To sum up, the Prime Minister has a good friend who was traveling with him on the Aga Khan's, Aga Khan's island, a close friend who was managing the partisan liberal list thanks to public funds from MPs, and the Prime Minister is asking Canadians to believe that no rule has been violated. Who asked members to pay for Mr. Pitfield's services, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, who on the other side is giving the directive to block everything this government is doing right now, Mr. Speaker? Who is telling members to block the money for the wage subsidy, for rent assistance, for those who have lost their jobs? Who is telling the Conservatives to filibuster the Environment Bill? Who is telling the opposition to block the Cultural Sector Bill to help people who are suffering in the cultural sector? Who's giving that order? The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, on Thursday, I asked the Minister of Official Languages why she did not want the Charter of the French Language to apply to all Quebecers, and her answer says a lot. She said that for the first time in history, the federal government is stepping up to protect the French language. That is quite the admission. I have a suggestion for the Minister. Why doesn't the federal government, for the first time in history, why doesn't the federal government let Quebec determine its own linguistic rules? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm always very happy to answer my colleagues' questions. I'm always very pleased to do, so to do so because it enables me to present the government's position. And our position is that we want to protect the French language. We want to protect it. We, recognize, we want to recognize new rights, the right to work in French, to be served in French, in federally regulated businesses. I think my colleagues should be pleased because for years, even decades, it's been 30 years now, the Bloc Québécois has been asking for more protection for French. And that is what this Liberal government is doing. We should work on this together. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, for the first time in history, the federal government could respect the French language charter. For the first time in history, the government, the federal government could recognize that when it comes to the French language in Quebec, Quebec should be the one making the decisions. For the first time in history, the federal government could step up and protect French by letting Quebec protect French. Will the Minister of Official Languages respect the will of Quebec for the first time in history? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, my colleague surely has some questions about the very existence of her party in the House of Commons. Because the Black Québécois has been asking for more protections for French for decades, that is what we're doing, we're delivering. Of course, the Bloc Québécois is always trying to pick fights with the federal government. 
it always is looking for reasons to argue in order to be able to move forward with their sovereignist agenda because they simply are looking for ways to defend the cause of Quebec independence. But it doesn't work because what Quebecers want is for us to protect French, but do that within a united Canada. The Quebecers want us to focus on their concerns and create opportunities for them. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, unlike what the Minister would have us believe, it is not true that her bill better protects French in Quebec. It is full of grandfathered-in exemptions and exceptions. There are good things in the bill for minority uh, French language communities. That's great. That was necessary. But for Quebec, it's no Bill 101. The Minister says that she really wants to protect French in Quebec. In that case, can she justify why her party is the only one which refused to support our bill to ensure that federally regulated businesses would be subject to the Charter of the French Language? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we see here once again that the Bloc Québécois is just trying to scare people. If my colleague would carefully and attentively read the bill that we tabled, she would know she would know that we are ready to recognize the application of the French language charter to, uh, to federally regulated businesses that are already registered and any further uh, businesses that might be interested in becoming subject to the charter. And we want to ensure that the right to work or be served in French, we want to ensure that, that those rights be respected. So we are creating our own federal approach and that will strengthen French in Quebec and also elsewhere in the country in regions with a large number of French speakers. Member for Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, the government introduces their budget, limited targets, and one of the few measurements was the declaration of one million jobs recovered by the end of June on Chart 35. Facts. Between March and May of this year, our economy lost jobs. We have the second highest unemployment rate of all the G7, and inflation is running rampant. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister deliver on his promise of one million jobs recovered by the end of June, yes or no? The Honourable Speaker, or sorry, the Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to answer the question. With respect, the Honourable Member seems not to appreciate the difference that our economy is experiencing in a positive way as a result of the measures that we have put in place to support Canadian households and businesses through this pandemic. Yes, in order to protect lives from the threat of COVID-19, provincial governments had put public health measures in place, including in Nova Scotia, which is reporting zero cases today. The reason that we expect such a profound recovery is because we have supports designed to help businesses. I'm disappointed, however, that the Conservative member and his colleagues are obstructing the proceedings of Parliament to prevent these benefits from reaching businesses and workers. I'm confident that we will meet our target and exceed it in a timely way, so long as we have measures in place that will help continue to support households and businesses through this pandemic. Before going to the next question, I just want to point out there's someone, there's a few microphones that keep popping on. I want the Honourable Members to be uh, careful and make sure that their microphone is on if they're not asking a question. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Well, Mr. Speaker, timely. It appears that another promise made, promise failed when the government doesn't meet its benchmark of a return of creation of one million Canadian jobs by the end of this month. Between March and May, the unemployment rate rose from 7.5 to 8.2 percent. That's 1.6 million Canadians out of work. Jobs come from growth, and there's a lack of focus on this government on actions that will grow the economy. Mr. Speaker, can the Prime Minister tell us today where did the jobs go and what is the new date on when they're coming back? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, with respect, it is disappointing but not surprising to see that the Conservatives take such glee in Canadians who are put out of work in order to protect the lives of their families and neighbours. The reality is, yes, there has been a short-term hit to job numbers because provincial governments have restricted economic activity to save people's lives and preserve the long-term economic outlook for their provinces. The Nova Scotia example is a prime example, Mr. Speaker, who's recently rebounded from a lockdown with zero cases today. My only wish is that the Conservatives would stop obstructing the benefits that are designed to trigger growth and contribute to what is projected to be a profound... The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can assure you I'm not laughing. Jobs are not being created. The economy is not growing and we're slipping in our G7 position. Canadians are desperate. The Prime Minister sold this budget as a growth plan, but evidently it's nothing more than a marketing plan towards an election. 
We cannot talk our way into a better future. My constituents are sick and tired of the lack of deliverables and want action. Enough with the, the theatrics and the sales pitch budget. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister come forward with specific growth targets and clean, clear timelines by economic sector? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, if the Honourable Member wants to compare to our G7 counterparts, I would point him to the fact that we have a 64.6 labour force participation rate in Canada compared to 61.6 in the United States. I would point him to the fact that 80.9% of uh, the jobs have returned from peak job losses here compared to 65.9% in the United States. The reality is we are seeing a relatively stronger economic rebound because we had relatively stronger public health measures that were put in place. I would point again to the example of Nova Scotia that did see 22,000 jobs shut down last month, which previously had 100% of the economic activity returned. Today, my province is reporting zero cases, and we expect that to allow us to accelerate out of this pandemic recession if only the Conservatives would get out of the way and allow important measures that target growth specifically so the economy can come roaring back immediately. The Honourable Deputy. The Honourable Member for Rosemont, La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker. The Liberals have decided to cut the uh, CRB while thousands of businesses are only slowly starting to reopen and while entire sectors are still under lockdown. The cultural sector and tourism uh, are good examples. What is the government basing these cuts on? Scientific studies? Committee of experts? Maybe they read tea leaves? We want more than just talk, talking points and platitudes. People deserve clear answers. Why are the Liberals deciding to cut the help that people desperately need? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning of the pandemic, our government has worked hard to keep Canadians healthy, safe and supported. Our emergency and recovery income support measures are helping buffer the worst economic impacts and continue to help Canadians put food on the table. To continue supporting workers through this pandemic, we presented a plan in Budget 2021 to extend the Canada Recovery Benefits up to 50 weeks and the Canada Recovery Caregiving Benefit up to 42 weeks. We're also helping Canadians re-enter the labour market by creating 500,000 new training and work opportunities and launching the Canada Recovery Hiring Benefit. Mr. Speaker, we are doing everything we can. We just need the support of every member in this House to get the support to Canadians that they need. The Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Well, there it is again, Mr. Speaker. When the government talks about extending the Canada Recovery Benefit, what they don't say and the Canadians need to hear is that they're cutting the amount of the support by 40% from $500 a week to $300 a week. So New Democrats have been consistently opposing that cut. I think the government at least owes Canadians the decency to hear it out of the mouth of the minister that they are cutting that benefit even as they extend it by 40%. Will the minister at least just fess up and put it on the record that they're cutting the benefit by 40%? Well, minister. Sorry, Mr. Speaker, I, you know, the CRB is part of a comprehensive set of emergency and recovery measures to support Canadian workers. Through the CRB, Canadians could have up to access of up to 50 weeks of benefit. Yes, Mr. Speaker, the first 42 weeks at $500, the last eight weeks at $300, but they also have access to more flexible EI benefits, to have access to the wage subsidy. All these other programs are in jeopardy, Mr. Speaker, if, if this House doesn't pass C30. That's what's at stake. Our entire recovery infrastructure is at stake if we don't get together and support C30. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sydney, Victoria. Mr. Speaker, in 2007, the Conservative government chose to vote against the adoption of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. In the years since, Indigenous parliamentarians, including Romeo Saganash and I, amongst others, have worked diligently to rectify this mistake, resulting in our government's tabling and passing of C-15. On National Indigenous Peoples Day, could the Minister of Justice please update the House on C-15 and the work ahead to implement UNDRIP? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the member from Sydney, Victoria, for his important question on National Indigenous Peoples Day, for his advocacy and his efforts in helping us to get to this momentum, momentous landmark. And I, I would also like to salute and thank his father, Prof Professor Sakish Henderson, for all the work that he did in the development of the Declaration. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples passing in both chambers is an important step on the path towards reconciliation. It is not, however, the last one, Mr. Speaker. The real work begins once the declaration is adopted. We will continue to work 
with Indigenous peoples across Canada to support the co-development of an action plan, implementing and achieving the objectives of the Declaration. Mr. Speaker, we're building a better country for all our children and grandchildren. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, a Toronto birthday party that should have been a celebration instead ended in tragedy. A one-year-old, a five-year-old and an 11-year-old indiscriminately shot, caught in the crossfire. This shocking and outrageous act of gun violence against the precious lives of innocent children is devastating. Violent gun offences are on the rise increasingly because of illegal guns. This government has done nothing for six years. When will this minister act to protect Canadians and remove illegal guns from our communities? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I share her outrage about this terrible act of gun violence that took place in Toronto, in which innocent children were the victims. Mr. Speaker, that's precisely why we've taken strong action to strengthen gun control, which, which, is, which is a different approach, where the Conservatives have promised the gun lobby that they'll weaken it. Mr. Speaker, we have prohibited a number of weapons designed uh, for, for killing people, and we've brought forward strong new legislation that will address all of the ways in which criminals gain access to guns. Additionally, we've made significant investments in policing and in communities. And I would urge the member opposite to support those measures because communities and the police need our help. Honourable Member for Medicine Hat, Cardson Warner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, the Minister continues to mislead Canadians without response. Under this government, gang violence continues to terrorize our communities, just like it did in Etobicoke this weekend. In Toronto, there have been over 160 shootings with dozens injured or killed in the last six months alone. The Liberals' field approach with C-71, the gun ban, the confiscation plans, and C-21 focused on law-abiding, lawful firearm owners rather than illegal firearms and criminals. Instead of deceitful, tired talking points, when will this minister admit their plans are failing and put forward measures that actually protect Canadians? Well, a minister. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. And, and once again, the Conservatives demonstrate their, their absolute commitment to weaken gun control and keep their promises to the gun lobby. But in fact, Mr. Speaker, um, and the member referenced Bill C-71. The Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police de deemed Bill C-71 essential to public safety. In addition, we've introduced strong new legislation that addresses all of the ways in which criminals gain, get, get access to guns through smuggling, through theft, and through criminal diversion. Mr. Speaker, we will strengthen gun control in this country, and we will invest in in policing and communities to keep our communities safe. The Honourable Member Charlesbourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, without the vigilance of the media and the Conservative Party, the Prime Minister would have allowed the Chinese Communist regime access to our embassies around the world by allowing Nuktek, a company controlled by the regime, to install their X-ray machines. Fortunately, we convinced him it was a mistake, and he cancelled the contract. But the same company already installed devices at our borders and airports. Now, if this posed a security risk to our embassies, will the Prime Minister understand that this is a risk and take these machines out of our airports and borders? The Honourable Minister. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, let me assure the member opposite that, that our border security officers re remain extremely vigilant with res respect to all national security concerns. They work very collaboratively with our national security intelligence agencies and law enforcement, and, and we take their advice on all procurement decisions. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have been assured that the devices that the member to which the member references pose no risk to Canadian national security, um, and, and but we will remain vigilant. Well, member for Edmonton West. Mr. Speaker, the minister knows that this is not true. This government knowingly installed security compromised nuke tech equipment at our borders and airports. The operation committee's recommendations are clear. Remove the nuke tech equipment from our airports and borders and ban the purchase of tech from Chinese state-owned companies. Now, will this government act on this report to protect Canadians or will it instead continue to admire the basic Chinese dictatorship? Honourable Minister. Again, I want to thank the member for, for the question because it gives me an opportunity to clarify that I have been assured by our border service officers that the use of, of this equipment in no way compromises uh, Canadian uh, interests or, or, in, or, or data, and that the, the, the devices are effective for the purposes to which they are used. 
but they do not pose a significant risk to public safety. Um, but I want to also assure the member that we will continue to be vigilant. Um, and uh, as I shared with this House back in December, um, we are well aware and informed this House of the concerns that we have with respect to any opportunity for foreign interference from any hostile actor. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, the military justice process for dealing with sexual misconduct is a farce. As former Supreme Court Justice Morris Fish has told us, it's a system in which senior officers interfere in order to control the process. He also talks about recommendations that were rejected with comments like, it would hurt his career, or let's give him another chance. In short, it's a system that protects abusers. Justice Fish made 107 recommendations, but unfortunately, the current Minister of the Defense is the one who's supposed to implement them. Mr. Speaker, does anyone even still believe that this will happen? The Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are absolutely committed to making sure that we create a harassment-free workplace and free of uh, absolute misconduct. And I thank the work that uh, Justice Fish uh, has done. Uh, we are accepting all the recommendations. And in fact, we have actually started implementing uh, th 36 of the recommendations. And we'll be also working alongside with uh, Justice, uh, uh, Madam Justice Arbour on the next steps as well. Thank you. The Honorable, Deputy de... the Honorable Member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, if the government is so determined to change the culture of sexual misconduct in the military, it needs to explain itself. For the past month, the Liberals have been filibustering the Defense Committee to avoid having to reveal the committee's report on sexual misconduct to this House. As we speak, we don't even know if there will be a report in the end. My question is for the Liberal Chair of the Defense Committee. When will she stop allowing her committee to block the accountability the victims of sexual misconduct expect? The Honorable Minister. The Honorable Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker. When it comes to the work of the, of the committee, uh, they make their own decisions, but I look forward to the recommendations that the members uh, have been uh, working on. I know that our members uh, of, of the committee are absolutely committed to supporting the survivors, and the antics that the opposition co continues to make is to, to prevent that work. Our government has worked since we formed government uh, and provide uh, support uh, to survivors for the passage of Bill C-77. We know that we have a lot more work to do, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. Member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, Canadian farmers, producers, and processors are worried about market access to international markets. They are unsure whether current market access that they have right now will continue. They also want to know if they will regain access to markets that have been closed to them. Now, I met with many stakeholders who are very concerned that this government does not have their back on this. So, Speaker, will the government assure this House that it is actively working to guarantee and open market access for Canadian farmers, producers, and processors? Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and let me just repeat, if, if the member is not aware, that Canada has actually been playing a leadership role since the very beginning of this pandemic, whether it's the World Trade Organization or elsewhere, in order to ensure that we keep our supply chains open and that no country turns inwards and we keep our rules-based international trading system intact. We will continue to advocate for free trade right across the world, and we will take every action necessary to defend our farmers and all of our exports here in Canada. Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Mr. Speaker, now that Canada is finally starting to catch up to the rest of the developed world on immunization, provinces, territories and municipalities are beginning to reopen. Uh, but Canada's borders are under federal jurisdiction, and there is still no clear plan for a permanent safe reopening. Thousands of small businesses are dependent on tourism, and they are being left behind by this federal government. Once again, Mr. Speaker, when will this government finally table a comprehensive, detailed reopening plan? The Honourable Minister. Well, first, let me say, Mr. Speaker, over 36.3 million doses of vaccines have been shipped and 32.2 million doses administered. We are indeed making progress, Mr. Speaker. And I will say this, today there's good news for fully vaccinated Canadian travellers and others with right of entry to Canada. Because of their full vaccination status, they will be able to avoid some measures of quarantine, uh, including the obligation to stay in a hotel. We'll always use science 
science and evidence, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, to guide our next steps on the border. And we thank Canadians for stepping up and getting vaccinated in such incredible numbers. Honourable Member for South Surrey, White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. More than 265,000 jobs were lost in the past two months. In April, the number of Canadians receiving regular employment insurance was up nearly 10% overall, but up more than 22% for women. Mr. Speaker, women in South Surrey White Rock who had jobs don't want EI, they want to work. Does the Prime Minister accept any responsibility for these job losses? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, um, I, I thank the Honourable Member for the question. When she refers to the job losses in the past couple of months, she ignores the fact that after the previous wave, we actually saw more than 560,000 jobs created. When she's talking about the specific measures that are designed to help women take part in this economic rebound, I will acknowledge that women have disproportionately been impacted. That is specifically why we have made great game-changing investments in childcare to allow more women to enter the workforce. It's why we've made new investments to encourage women entrepreneurship to help kickstart economic growth. It's why we're going to continue to put supports in place that have undergone a gender-based analysis so we can understand the impact of our investments and how they impact women and men differently. With respect to the honorable member, the best she th thing she can do if she wants to support women's participation in this recovery is to get out of the way, stop obstructing Bill C-30 so these supports can reach the people who need them. The honorable member for Saint-Michel. Mr. Speaker, during the pandemic, it's become increasingly clear how important it is to have a safe and affordable home. I've heard from constituents in my writing that affordable housing is an urgent priority. Whether you're a young student, a new family, or a senior, affordable housing is integral to one's well being and ability to achieve one's goals. Could the Minister of Families, Children, and Social Development? Please inform this House of the work that's being done to make affordable housing a reality. The federal government is committed to helping Quebecers and Canadians find a safe and affordable home. Since 2015, our government has invested over $4 billion in housing in Quebec. On June 3rd, we announced more than $20 million in federal support for affordable student housing in Montreal. We will continue to work tirelessly on behalf of Canadians and Quebecers. Merci. The Honourable Member for Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Fisheries and Ocean Specific Salmon Strategy is nothing but more empty promises. This Liberal government has been in power for six years and once again they have failed to listen to our BC fishers to develop and implement an effective plan to conserve and restore Pacific salmon. We don't need any more studies. We don't need any more stall tactics. We have experts on the water that know what needs to be done and it needs to be done now. When is the Minister going to start listening to BC anglers and get to work to restore our BC public fishery? When? The Honourable Minister. Speaker, I want to thank my honourable colleague for the question, and I, I actually agree with him. We, we absolutely have uh, expertise on the West Coast with regards to the wild Pacific salmon, the declines that we're seeing. That's why we're developing in, in collaboration with those organizations, communities, with First Nations and with British Columbia, the province of British Columbia, the Pacific Salmon Strategy. This government is very proud of the fact that we're investing $647 million in that strategy. Mr. Speaker, we know we have to do everything we possibly can to restore wild Pacific salmon. The Honourable Member for Belchasse, de chemin les vies Mr. Speaker, with the Pierre Laporte Bridge closing in a few days, the construction of the third link will become more important than ever for maintaining the connection between Quebec City and Les Vies. So when will the Liberals support this third link and help support our regions and motorists? Will the Liberals finally give their support to this project, which is so essential to regional urban mobility? The Honourable Minister. 
Merci, Monsieur le Président. Comme vous savez, nous faisons des... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you know, we're making historic investments in Quebec. I was with the member uh, for Quebec and with the Quebec Premier when we made an announcement last week. The third link is an important project, and we're always interested to assess the projects that uh, are proposed, and we will continue to work on them. Calgary Forest Lawn. Mr. Speaker, for the 2020 Parent and Grandparent Sponsorship Application Term, 209,174 applications were submitted. To date, zero applications have been processed. Even worse, this current processing time is estimated to be 28 months. This liberal-made backlog mess is hurting young families, minorities, and our economy while they pile on more platitudes and election promises. When is this government going to fix their failed application system? Well, minister. Mr. Speaker, our government has an exceptional track record in meeting our immigration goals. We welcomed tens of thousands of temporary workers to keep our economy going, adding 100 million to protect their rights. We've reunited tens of thousands of families, showing compassion where we can. And we've created new pathways for refugees, demonstrating global, global leadership on human rights. Mr. Speaker, even in the face of the pandemic, we have a plan that shows how immigration creates jobs and growth. And that is in stark contrast to the years of failures under the last Conservative government. Honourable Member for Cumberland Colchester. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Nova Scotians have been forever impacted by gun violence. Many constituents here in Cumberland Colchester, particularly women, have told me that they support fully implementing Bill C-71, which addresses domestic violence with red flag legislation through lifetime background checks, helps law enforcement trace firearms, and addresses the sale of firearms to those without a license. Meanwhile, worryingly, the Conservative leader is promising to weaken background checks, remove support for our police, and return military firearms to the streets. Can the Minister of Public Safety please reassure women and other concerned citizens by updating us on measures to bring... The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Cum from Cumberland Colchester for her very important question. And I most certainly share her concern over Conservative promises to weaken gun control. I want to assure this House that our government is listening to all those concerned with gun violence. And we are responding to the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, who, deem who deemed Bill C-71 essential to public safety. Earlier today, we tabled regulations that will strengthen license verification and record keeping in Canada. These measures will enable strong action to prevent the sale of firearms to those not legally authorized to possess them, and they will they will provide enhanced support to law enforcement to hold criminals to account. Together, Mr. Speaker, these measures will prioritize public safety and empower effective police work. The Honourable Member for Windsor West. Mr. Speaker, the border between the United States and Canada has been closed for the past 16 months due to the COVID pandemic and following the science to protect public health. But now, with Canadians and Americans being fully vaccinated, it's time to follow the science and once again begin the reopening for families who have been separated for a long time and for businesses who are struggling to survive. No more half measures and inadequate responses. People have sacrificed and suffered enough. When will this government follow the science and open the border to Canadians and Americans who are fully vaccinated? Canadians need a clear plan. When will they do it? Mr. Speaker, that's exactly on this side of the House what we've been doing. We've been following the science and the evidence. We've been working so hard to make sure that the sacrifices that Canadians have made over the past year and a half are not wasted. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to take prudent measures to relax measures on the border as based on science and evidence. And today is a good day, Mr. Speaker. Starting July 5th, fully vaccinated travellers who are currently permitted to enter Canada will not be subject to existing quarantine requirements. Mr. Speaker, we can see the finish line. Let's get there together. The Honourable Member for Don Valley East. Yeah, 
Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a recent report by the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group says that a secretive division of the CRA is unfairly targeting Muslim charities with audits amounting to discrimination. The report found that 75% of the charities audited and whose status was revoked were Muslim charities, despite them representing only 0.47% of the overall sector. Can the minister explain what is being done to stop this harassment? Thank you. The Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government will continue to work to end discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and disability. The CRA monitors the operations of registered charities and ensures compliance through a balanced program of client service, education, and responsible enforcement, including audits to protect the integrity of the charitable sector. The CRA does not select registered charities for audit based on any particular faith or denomination. The Minister of National Revenue does not instruct the CRA to begin audits, nor does the Minister intervene in audits underway. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's all the time we have for question period today. C'est tout le temps que nous avons. That is all the time.